So uh, drawing class, we're back from spring break, and we are going to start into a lesson that makes me really happy. Um, we're going to talk about comic strips. So things that are like ho, 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 ho. these guys. So um, there's going to be a couple options to do comics, but before we get into that, uh, we have some things we are going to talk about and do. I'm looking at my notes over here. So uh, let's, let's check um, and see what you guys know. What do you guys know about comics? So far, the Q&A is going great. Hey, it's Robert. His did not ding, it's taking him a long time to join. So I tell you, you guys know nothing about comics? Okay, so there's squares, right? And then there's pictures in those squares that make a story. Okay, good job. Um, do they have to be realistic in their look? Hi, Robert. So guessing by the uh, picture that stares at me and the other two of you guys. So um, I'm gonna show you a comic. Once I get my mouse, there it goes, okay. So we're gonna pop here, pop there. And make sure I get chat back on. Move that here in case you guys send me a message. So uh, this is my lesson plan. <laughs> um, peanuts. Are you guys familiar with the Peanuts comic? Yeah. So inside of this, um, it's created by Charles Schultz. Um, and it originally started dailies in 1950s. And then two years later, it started doing Sundays. And there's a difference between daily strips and Sunday strips. We'll get into it. doesn't matter. Uh, down here, we can see some of the main characters. And one of the main characters is a dog, Snoopy, um, who could be probably one of the more famous one out of the Peanuts group. Snoopy, um, there's two types of characters we have. We have anamorphic characters and zoomorphic characters. And I'm not going to define those. You guys are going to define those. Um, as we go through this. But uh, the comics, um, Peanuts is probably one of the easily most recognized comics um, of its genre. And it has, uh, it, it lists under humor, a gag a day, satire, and children. Although at times they aren't doing really childlike or childish type comics. So we're just gonna poke over here and we're gonna look um, at these kind of layouts by Mr. Schultz. And we're gonna talk a little bit about the comic strip. So uh, when, we, when we see this guy here, um, anything that's usually in color in a big amount, that was your original Sunday strip. And here you can see a, a Sunday comic in black and white. Um, and that would have been due to its era and time frame. it would have done been all black and white. And you can see, uh, these, this is a very early comic because Snoopy and Charlie Brown look a little different. Charlie changes very little over time, but Snoopy has a pretty big evolution. And here we can see a more modern day Charlie Brown comic as we go through things. So we said, uh, um, Shelby said there's squares and these squares are called panels or a cell. Um, and then the space in between this space is called your gutter. And then this is your edge. And we, we need to have those defined. If we notice, um, the panels are nice and neat boxes um, or rectangles. And the gutters are easily defined. So a newspaper comic or a daily strip comic usually plays pretty good in with those gutters and strips. Now this is an original, um, so it was for the uh, Sunday um, and it would have been a photo. Uh, this would have been shot with a camera and then printed in with 
the newspaper. Um, these marks up here are telling total dimensions that the artist was working in because they have a certain spot. Now, the nice thing is, is that originally um, when drawn out, they necessarily weren't always drawn to a perfect size. They're drawn to a close size, but this could be edited after it was, take, after it was shot. Um, once the picture was taken, they could shrink it or enlarge it as they needed for the paper. Nowadays with digital, artists can work in any size and then they can shrink these things down. So uh, look, we're gonna go through some anatomy. Um, this is a cell wall and this is a panel. This is a title frame. It tells us the cartoon uh, and it gives us a featuring good old Charlie Brown because this is an older one um, and it has the artist signature all in the title frame. This is a Sunday layout. It's a Sunday layout because it's usually double size of a daily strip. Um, and then we start off right into the action. So here we have Charlie watching an old school TV. And then we have this thing. Does anyone know what this is called? Nobody? Hold up. I'm zooming in to see it. I can make it bigger if you want. Is It's like a text box. Kind of. It is. Um, in cartoons, we call those bubbles. And uh, it's got this little staticky line around it. And you can see that it has a pointer. So the sound is coming from the TV. And this is what's, what you're hearing on the TV. Charlie Brown has no interaction right now. He's just watching the TV. More, more talk from the TV. Now, we know it's a talk bubble because its tail and pointer are solid. Uh, and we're going to go into some different types of speech bubbles here in a bit. Um, coming over, we have another character introduced. And again, TV still talking. So this staticky line is defining for you, the reader, that this, the TV has a different sound. Um, this character is reacting and she is speaking. And not only is it bold print, so we can um, get some inference towards the text or thought by the type of text. Um, and over here, much bigger words, and we can tell by her mouth that she must be yelling as she runs out the door. And then she's very excited. The words take up the almost two thirds of the frame here as she tells another character whose hair is being blown back as she kind of goes around. Um, notice, what are these little lines? Does anyone know what those lines are or what they represent? Movement. Shelby, Shelby, Shelby. could you say that a little bit louder? Like Movement. Movement. Uh, you guys have it completely right. Anytime we have lines around or near the character, it's going to represent action of some type. So this, she's running, she must be running really fast because she's moving. We also have these little kind of, um, uh, motions coming off of her. Uh, here she's shaking because the lines are close on both sides of her. Um, and then sometimes you'll have motions like around arms. Uh, here again, uh, as she's yelling, this could be, it could be representing like spittle coming out of her mouth or it could just be an action line. So all of those lines are called action lines. Now, when we look here at the side of the TV, those are not action lines, that's just shading. And it's a, again, this is an older comic. Um, when we look, it's not as, a, as the original because Snoopy has evolved into more of a modern style Snoopy here. Um, and the characters are kind of in their more modern looks to them. Um, and then when you're, you're checking them out, uh, we have lines that help us fill. Uh, we have uh, the pattern onto Charlie Brown's clothes. But this is not a completely filled in pair of pants here. We can see where... Uh, Mr. Schultz maybe purposely left or didn't completely fill in some of the spots. Even inside of Charlie Brown's shirt, it becomes kind of quintessential that some of the lines aren't completely filled in here. They're nice and solid. In a modern comic, um, if you're doing this digitally, most artists would use a program like Photoshop and they would just click and fill and you get much more solid fill lines. So not only does the artist sign it here, but if we look at the end of the strip, there's his signature again. Um, in a daily strip, 
we would definitely have a signature spot. And then right over here underneath the marquee, there's a number dash, and that could be month and day, or it could be sequence um, that keeps track for the artist. So uh, these are the Peanuts uh, guys. Uh, Mr. Schultz was, uh, it was such a popular, it did make time, it made Life magazine covers. Uh, he was well known for keeping his secret. Once asked by, um, so by an up and coming artist, hey, Mr. Schultz, uh, what advice would you give to a new um, artist who wants to, to draw comics? And he said, don't because I don't want you to break into my business and take my money. He was very secretive. And uh, now, after Mr. Schultz has passed away, and after his wife passed away, the comics have reverted, um, the ownership, the copyright has reverted to his family. And now you start to see things like MetLife has the Peanuts uh, Gallery, and they'll show up to promote things. While Mr. Schultz was alive, several companies approached him and he refused uh, to let them use the peanut, uh, the peanut characters in their commercials or advertisements because he wanted to keep the rights to himself. And we're gonna talk about that when we talk about artist burnout on Wednesday. So uh, Peanuts, very popular character, and, and there's some basic vocab inside of what we were just, uh, what we were just going over. Boop, boop, I'm, I'm clicking through my tabs. Um, there we are. So we've talked a little bit about Peanuts. Um, when, do you guys have an idea, when do you think comics started? When did people officially start using comics? And you know, like, can you give me one of their original reasons what a comic was used for? Um, like when cities first started having newspapers? <laughs> So that's a, it's a great, um, it is the newspaper and the comic kind of go hand in hand. There's a little bit of things that happen in between. Um, when we look at monarchies or imperialism, uh, usually people who have, who have power and wealth don't like to be criticized. So a lot of um, like reports or information couldn't look at them critically, but comics could be satirical and could actually do depictions of royalty or people in power and make them look comical. So the term comic actually comes from making someone into a character or making them look comical in their um, representation. And that's where comics really start, is, is it starts as a way for people to make fun of the British king of the time or the French king of the time without suffering persecution. Now, that doesn't mean that they were immune from persecution. Uh, you could go so far. Um, American colonists, when they would put in satirical comics, sometimes those were very critically looked at. And, and an artist has to be careful. There's a fine line between, okay, ha ha, this is funny, and hey, we'd like you to meet our dungeon. So comics are, are quite old. Uh, we can go back to probably around, um, I think the 1400s is when our first little comics start to appear. Now, we can push it back even further. Um, not looking at Lascaux caves because we don't understand Lascaux and the cave drawings there, but if we go back to ancient Roman times, people were doing graffiti comics on the walls of the cities in Rome. And we have sections of cities or we have old places where people did graffiti style comic art. And um, it would, they were of different natures depending on what the people were de depicting, but they were normal citizens who would, when they could sneak over, draw on the wall. So comics, actually, we can go back into even further if we look at the graffiti era of comics. So I'm not talking modern graffiti where people either get paid or, or illegally go out and spray paint on things. Um, similar idea because these people didn't have permission, um, but this is, it was more of a bent on a satirical or a representational type of comic. Um, we're gonna use a little bit of math when we do this. So uh, for our comic, you're gonna have two choices. We're gonna do a comic strip or a comic book. 
Um, either way, you're gonna have to play with a little bit of math. So, find my metal ruler. I have a clear one, but for this demo, clear ones aren't gonna work, so we'll use the metal guy. And we have to know inches, biggest marks on a ruler is the inch mark um, because we're Americans and we believe in imperial math. Next biggest mark is the half inch, quarter inch, and then we have eighths and sixteenths of an inch. So if I go to, ooh, maybe it's not, let's have this ruler. Uh, this ruler is, so between each inch line, um, if I go by quarters, there's gonna be four, four quarters in a dollar, four, four quarters in a hole. So one fourth of an inch, half inch, three fourths of an inch, full inch, one, one over one. Um, some of our borders, some of our, our border spaces are gonna be a quarter of an inch. So this first gap. Some of our gutters are gonna be an eighth or a sixteenth of an inch, really kind of small, kind of thin little lines. It depends on how much space you need for your comic. Uh, one of the nice things, so we're gonna start, uh, we're gonna talk about, and when we talk about comics, we're gonna look at from roughly the 1950s, a little bit 1940s, but 1950s to present day. Um, what's the biggest change in the industry from 1950 to 2020. I'll give you a hint. It's in front of you right now. Oh, technology. Technology has made a huge difference. So um, when we think of comic books, uh, comic books immediately with all the pop culture going on, we think of Marvel and DC. They're the biggest comic book company um, and they have branched um, from their paper issues into movie, video, TV. Originally, um, if you think of the art room over at Springfield High School, uh, picture a room that big in New York, and that was the studio space for Marvel and DC. Each one of them had a room that big. Um, on the side, there would be offices for like the big people. So Stan Lee would have an office and out into the, what they called the bullpen was all of the artists. Newest artists were way in the back and the more experienced, the more veteran artists were closer to the front. And then depending on your work position is where you sat. So all the drawers were closer to the front and all of the inkers and color people were closer to the back. So that that way you could work, work, work and you just pass your paper to the person behind you, and that person did their job, and then you pass it to the person behind them. Um, when we think of comics, uh, and it's very traditional, especially when you look at people, um, and so we're gonna go back to the 1950s, and, and actually we're gonna go 1940s. 1940s Marvel Comics is kind of, um, it, it's gonna start a change in the industry. So prior to World War II, uh, Marvel Comics are uh, basically making cutesy stories. They're telling us little things. Um, they're doing uh, one shot, not episodic. Episodic is continuing from story to story. It's a one shot, little cutesy thing. Uh, when World War II breaks out, the comic industry goes into the patriotic swing and they tell stories of heroism. And Marvel is one of the first to tell a story of a hero about the war, Captain America. And he becomes a wartime comic. Um, inside of that, you had usually one person who wrote the story and one person who did all of the art jobs. So when we look at, ooh, ooh I lost my, man, where's my mouse keep going? Um, there it is. So when we look at comic books and the difference between, um, so Marvel Comics started in 1939 in New York to present. Um, Stan Lee was the editor. He is no longer editor-in-chief. Um, and he went into and made Marvel Entertainment, which is now all owned by Disney. 
So when we look at uh, a traditional comic, so uh, here we have comic covers, we have comic pages. And this is a pretty old one, it's only 25 cents. See if we can get a good look at this cover. So um, this comic when released was 25 cents. Today's price is almost $14 because it is a classic comic. I'm trying to get my, there's my chat menu back. Uh, when we look at some of the things, uh, we have the title of a comic on the front page. Um, we have an action scene going on here. Uh, we have the issue number, the month it was issued. Uh, this was printed in a time where American comic books had a censorship. And uh, if you didn't submit to being self-censored, and what that meant was is you wrote the stories, but then you submitted it to a company who would approve it or not approve it. Um, a lot of the parents of, the, of this genre would not buy the comic for their, for their kids. Um, other than that, we have a couple little splashes. Um, Wolverine is appearing in this comic, so it looks like Wolverine and the Hulk are fighting. Uh, it is from the company, so we have the company's name up here, but we also have Incredible Hulk. It's one of their characters, all des described here. But we don't have anything about who the people are that worked on that. When we look at a, a more modern comic, do to do do to do not a more modern comic. So if we notice here, still has this uh, comic book seal of approval, um, but this is kind of getting into a little bit of, of risky era. Um, so uh, again, we have an issue number, a date, a cost. Uh, this is Miss Marvel, again from Marvel Comics. There's her title. Notice that her title is different style graphics. Every hero had its own style graphics. Um, we have some floaty heads, which if you are a comic aficionado, you know that these are Spider-Man characters. And this is one of the people that Spider-Man used to fight. But we have this exposed midriff. That's a little risky for the time. Um, and uh, over here we have her in a full dress. Uh, but this is something that could have caused them some problems to get it fully accepted. Uh, here, we have a little bit more modern comic. Uh, we have a barcode, we have a price. Notice the price change. Um, 80 years of Marvel. We have some information down the side. This tells you it's a bonus digital issue. Inside of this, you have a code that you can go on and you can actually read the comic with a digital reader. Um, again, uh, this is from Marvel Comics Presents and it's telling you who's, uh, who is starring in it. Um, it's the first issue of Marvel Comics Presents, but down here we have two names, and these are actually people that worked on the story. So we start to notice that the artists are getting credit, and um, the industry, until Marvel becomes popular enough, does not give credit to story writers, artists. Uh, they want to keep them kind of anonymous. And then as this um, as these build, and I'm trying to, here we go, this is a good one, Return of Wolverine. Um, we get to a point where, so again, we have a nice cover. This is a pretty much open one because uh, Wolverine is coming back here. But now we have a whole list of everybody who works on the comic itself. And, and Marvel is one of the first groups to really kind of push that um, to give recognition and creativity. Originally, the company who owns the comic would own everything inside of it. And it was uh, Stan Lee, Steve Ditko, um, the original kind of Marvel people who fought for the rights of artists uh, to keep their intellectual property. So instead of the company owning it, the company gets memberships, but they have creative rights too. And, and the creative rights Basically, it ensures that if you're using these characters, those people are still gonna get recognition and probably some money from inventing those characters. So that no longer could the company say they created Wolverine. 
Wolverine was created by Stan Lee. And, and the artist and the group that worked on that story when they first brought out the X-Men. Uh, so there's been an evolution in who has ownership of those kind of um, rights. Now, when we look at daily strips, the big difference with a daily strip is, is it's syndicated, but the artists kept the rights themselves. And Charles Schultz was a big um, proponent of holding on to his rights. Um, a, a lot of people, so you'll notice with modern music, sometimes with music, you'll hear a, a song and within six months or a year, the band has sold the song to a company um, that wants to use it in advertising. They'll use it as a jingle or they'll use it as just catchy music to grab your attention because you'll be like, oh yeah, I like that song. And then it's a commercial. And Schultz didn't want his characters to become commercialized. He wanted his characters to be strictly his characters. So um, after Schultz's death, the family started licensing his characters out, meaning that they get a percentage of the use of the character, but they're letting more and more people have control over that character. Um, one of the biggest things right now, if you notice, is Disney has bought Marvel, and in, in acquiring them, they technically own, own the rights to the Marvel characters. But due to licensing agreements, there are several other companies that do movies based on Marvel characters, and Disney cannot use those characters in their movies because they'd have to pay the other company to use those characters back. Um, so inside of the contracts, the, I mean, we're not going to get into contract law, but basically ownership usually goes with the company when you're looking at bigger corporation things. Comic books, bigger corporation, ownership of characters usually goes with the company. Um, comic strips, daily strips, ownership stays with me, the artist. And the difference in that is a creative team, a group that works on the comics, and an individual who works on the comics. So let's pop back over, go to the screen and wait for that to disappear. So um, this is just a Wikipedia page. It's a great place to start. And it's uh, basically comic strips throughout their history. And this is gonna give you a little bit. So saying newspaper, great guess. Um, is when they started, but we can go a little bit further back. And even here, um, to me, you can go all the way, you can go all the way back to Roman times to look at it. Uh, the nice thing about this is, is it gives us um, comics by countries. It, it gives us a little bit of information. Um, if you're really interested and you want to find out some of these things, um, some of the dates, it's interesting to see what comics were being done. And if we look at these, they're setting up the rules of how comics are made back a couple hundred years ago. Um, we can have, so comics used to start off as just simple panels or single cell prints. And um, it was just a quick little funny, or something to go with a story. Later on, they evolved into these bigger comics. So here we have uh, this 1943 um, little couple, and it's only two panels, one gutter in between, and it would have been put into uh, the paper. Uh, we have some nice line art happening. So here we have hatching going on, um, hatching through the trees, a full ink brush in the back. This would have been done by one person, everything. Um, all of the words, all of the story, that person created, and then they had to neatly lay everything out. Um, when you get into things like this, uh, you're starting to look at, so uh, we have two people working on this one here. This is 1941, and we can still see a little bit different. So sometimes comics are simplification of items, oh boy, simplification of form. And sometimes comics are more realistic in their display. Um, so this is just the Wikipedia page. 
and I'll put a link onto our Google Classroom because it's going to have things like size and format and all these wonderful things. I'm um, really quick. We're going to hop over to. Um, we'll drop. We'll take this link over. And again, we're in, we're in uh, Wikipedia, and we have speech bubbles. So this is a standard speech bubble. Uh, it's where the text appears, and most of the text. Uh, used to be handwritten. You had a special person who did nothing but lettering throughout your comic. And they would take excerpts of the story. So usually the drawing was done first, um, and then the inking, and then the lettering was added in. So they'd have to leave space for it. Or if they knew they were going to take pictures of it, um, they could use a little bit of wax. And they would put wax on the back of the speech bubbles, and the person would write them out, cut them, and then adhere them into the comic for the pictures. Still a speech bubble, I'm a little bit different design for it. Uh, this is a thought bubble. And we know it's a thought bubble, it still has a tail and it still points to who's doing the speaking, but these are not connected. So this would be something that you, the reader, would know that the person was thinking, but not saying. This is an action bubble. So it could be someone shouting or it could be an onomatopoeia. Um, we love the word onomatopoeia. Uh, here we have some uh, before the 20th century, and we have this person, he's talking on a scroll. And you can see it kind of scroll out, kind of a neat little idea. Um, 1775, uh, cartoon from Boston, so a revolutionary cartoon. And you have these really elongated, um, and they tapered from a tail and went out. But these are kind of all over the place, unlike modern comics which tries to control it. They wanna make it easy for you, the reader. So um, this is kind of neat to look through. Uh, the main things that you need to know uh, is what is lettering and you wanna know like different types of bubbles. Uh, you definitely wanna know what an onomatopoeia is, which unfortunately this does not talk about, um, but you guys are gonna discover that one on your own. Oh, my tab is right under there. So how important are comics? This is from uh, the University of Colorado, Boulder. And I actually took this course. And uh, it is a comic books and graphic novels class. It was an evaluation of comics and comic history. And this is the entire course that we did. Um, it was a sprint class for I think a total of eight weeks, but we had seven weeks of lecture right there. So comics are something that, that we kind of put, uh, we put some high value in. Let me see if I can close out some of my tabs and get, there we go. Uh, comics are meant for, uh, they're meant for general release. So what we would call a family comic. And then we have adult comics and teen comics. And it depends on what kind of stories are into them, uh, what kind of action level. So now you guys would notice the, the TV movie, the TV and movie rating system can be applied not only to, to music has a rating system, but comics can have a rating system as well. Uh, we've looked at the history. We've looked a little bit at the parts. Ooh, let's see if this one actually work works. Had a couple of them. Okay, it does. It's this guy here. Um, one of the first things we're gonna start talking about is before we actually draw, we're gonna do some creative writing. I knew this would excite you guys. So um, we're gonna work on some writing. Uh, for your writing, you're gonna have to describe your characters. You're gonna have to come up with a plot and a setting for your comic. So homework this week is gonna be, um, first and foremost, we're gonna make some characters. And you're gonna do what's called a front, side, and back view of a character. Um, we're going to do some headshots so that we get some different looks to our character's face and some expressions on them. Um, what characters are we doing? You are making up characters. So oh. uh, this week's homework is gonna be to design two characters. Okay. Whether you use them or not, that's gonna be up to you. And then we're gonna come up with a um, setting for this week and then uh, next week, we're going to start to work on, actually, 
over the weekend to going into next week, we'll work on a plot and, and we're going to go from there. Um, so I do have a couple of little things that I will post to help you guys. So here we have, these are some layouts and you can see um, up here we have different types of bubbles. Uh, we have uh, some onomatopoeias uh, and, and just some basic layouts. These could be either strip layouts or page layouts. All right, that's taking me too long to hop over to this guy. Uh, I will definitely put up this. This is a very classic, old, um, simple little face shape, but how to do some expressions. And then we're gonna use this as the basis for you guys to help develop your character expressions. And a lot of it is done with just how you put lines on the face. Uh, it is the angle of the eyebrows. How do you angle the mouth? And if you notice, none of these really show noses. Most of the expression that these are just kind of going through is just eyes and mouth and those lines. Um, the basics of a character design. So this is a, as it loads, um, this is a good front, back, and uh, there's a side, there's a little bit of a side view. These are some action poses of the character. And then these are headshots. And we can see it is 12 headshots with different expressions. Scroll down. This is uh, a twist on Aladdin story. And we have not only the characters in action poses, we have some reference for where these costumes are coming from. We still have a front view and a side view. Uh, we really don't have a back view on this one, though this says back and side. Uh, maybe that, yeah, that is a back view right there. So uh, we have props that go with it and then some different co color costume variants. And these are just what we call character studies. Um, you guys may know this person, Bugs Bunny, who comes from Warner Brothers. And this is a turnaround view. So it starts from the back and rotates slowly around the character until we get to the front view. Uh, front side back views, and then head expressions kind of bounced around. This is from 1943 era. Uh, Bugs has changed a little bit since this time. Actually, this is closer to the 1943 Bugs, and this is closer to what looks to be a little bit more of the more modern version. Um, in this study, so we have a height scale. We have the bottom of his foot because that's important because Bugs Bunny um, being animated would have been done by several artists and they all have to do similar work. So here we have a character scale. We've got Tweety Bird here on scale, and then we have Sylvester, and then these two lines would be represented by these two lines. So Tweety Bird at most would be just below Sylvester's belly, so that you have a scale between the characters. Um, I will put this link onto our Google Classroom as well, so you guys can see all of that. Uh, when we are done, depending on your choice, this is, uh, this is an old comic because this person was running for president. So this was the cover of their comic. Nope, not that way. And then this is the inside of their comic book. They did two pages. Uh, so eventually their story was about the election um, because when they did it, it was prevalent um, of that time. This was done uh, for uh, 429 of 2016. So this is a four-year-old comic. Um, so about the same time uh, that you guys are doing it, this person was doing it four years ago. Uh, you also have a choice to do, you can do a comic book or a comic strip, and I'm not gonna search for them because it's in there somewhere. Do to do, oh no, hit that, okay. So um, we did the introduction today for comics and we looked at a little bit of the comic history. Uh, homework this week is gonna be you designing two characters. Inside of design, here's what we're looking for. We're looking for full body, front, side, back view. We're looking for uh, 12 heads. 
and five expressions on those 12 heads. So you can either do 12 different expressions or you can do the same um, five over and over again, just to get them. Or you can have five expressions and then just five kind of faces. Uh, some different things you might want to think about is instead of just doing single plane view, what if your view is above the character, a bird's eye view, or a worm's eye view below the character looking up? Those could be some of your different angle shots. Uh, you don't have to worry about body action yet. Um, we don't have to worry about any of that. We're just going to concentrate on making a character and expressions. The second part of your homework is going to be when is your story set? Is your story going to be set now, current times? Is it going to be set in the future or is it going to be set sometime in the past? And that's all personal choices. Um, when we meet Thursday, we're going to talk about daily, daily strips and a Sunday or a comic book. Um, where you'll do two pages in a cover. So it, it works out to the same amount of work, the same amount of size and, and space. Uh, we're gonna try to do this on that heavy tag board, if you've got that still hanging around somewhere. And um, if not, we'll work on whatever paper we've got laying around. So that is this week, in a nutshell, we are starting comics. I am still collecting um, old work. Uh, I put down some reminders in the grade book today for you guys, for people that are missing stuff. Cool, cool, cool. Anybody got questions? No. <laughs> nope. All right, then. You guys are A-OK -okay for today, and you can, you can bounce, unless you got questions for me. It's good to see you, Robert. Yeah.